أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله أستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من يهدي لا فلا مدلة ومن يدلل فلا هادية وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له عز وجل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أشهد الله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يداي الساعة من يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يتسيه ما فإن لا يدر إلا نفسه ولا يدر لها شيئا أما بعد فقال الله تعالى في القرآن القديم في سورة بقرة بسم الله وإذ قال ربك للملائكة إني جائل في الأرض خليفة وقالوا أتجعل فيها من يفسد فيها ويسفك الدماء ونحن نسبح بحمدك ونقدس لك فلا إني أعلم ما لا تعلمون وصلح الله بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن القديم ونفعاني وياكم بالذكر الحكيم إنه هو جواد رؤوف رحيم الآن حي التاريخ أسيك رفوج الله من سيطان من شيطان الكرسد ديبو In the name of Allah the merciful the compassionate all praises due to Allah all thanks and gratitude is due to Allah. I seek his help and beg his forgiveness. And we seek refuge in the mischief and the evils of our souls. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none who can lead that person astray. And whomsoever Allah finds in error, there is none to guide them. I bear witness that there is no God, no deity <coughs> worthy of worship, except Almighty Allah, glory be to him who is one alone and unique without partner or associate. And I bear witness further that Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him is Allah's servant, messenger, and apostle. And he, Allah, has sent his messenger in truth and with the truth as a bearer of glad tidings and also as a warner in advance of the hour of judgment. Therefore, whosoever obeys Allah and his messenger, surely that person is rightly guided and whosoever disobeys the two of them, surely that person harms only his or her own soul and they harm not Allah the slightest little bit. <clears throat> as for what follows. For Allah, glory be to him, has said in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, the 30th ayah or verse. Behold, the Lord said to the angels, I am going to create a vicegerent on earth. They said, will you place therein one who will make mischief and shed blood while we <coughs> celebrate your praises and glorify your holy name. And he, Allah said, <coughs> I know what you do not know. And surely Allah Tabaraka with the eyes has spoken the truth. Oh, you who worship Allah. Today is a day of important significance. It is a day of important significance not because it is 
one of our holy days or sacred days that just passed already. It's not an important or significant day because the country or the leaders of the country, how the president, etc., have declared it to be some kind of special day. Today is an important day, a day of particular significance. Because at this very moment, during this hour, at massage it throughout the city of New York. Imams who are members of the Islamic Leadership Council of Metropolitan New York are giving khutbahs all on the same subject. This is, to our knowledge, an unprecedented act of mobilization and coordination in the history of Islam in New York City. In that, we are not <clears throat> leaving it up to people just to you know, talk about what they want to talk about, one week this, one week that, one week this subject, one week the next subject. But rather, a group of us got together and decided that we would each of us, in our own way, address an issue that is affecting all of us. And so, regardless of whether you're in Manhattan, or Brooklyn, or Queens, or Staten Island, or Long Island, or the Bronx, there are imams who are speaking today about the importance of enjoining the good of pursuing justice and forbidding the evil of religious extremism. I like to call it justice, yes, extremism, no. And so this is today's subject. If you are watching your uh, uh, television sets a couple of days ago. You saw myself and several of the imams of different ethnic groups. Some of us were African American, some of us were Arab, some of us were from Europe, some of us were from the Indian subcontinent. We were standing on the steps of City Hall making a declaration, justice, yes, extremism, violent extremism, no. And what caused us to reach this decision and to act in the way that we are acting, not only did we make a statement before the press, which has gone global. <clears throat> the statement that we made has been covered by every major news service throughout America. And according to what we've been able to see on the internet, also in different countries. And what prompted us to make the statement, to give these simultaneous quick bars Today, we uh, have launched a social media campaign as of today, wherein if you go to the website or the Facebook page for the Madri Sashura of Metropolitan New York, or if you uh, dwell in the realm of tweeting, I don't know what they call that realm, the realm of the tweet. Any of these places in social media starting today, when you go there, you're going to see the Mighty Shorter of Metropolitan New York offering guidance as to the importance of justice, yes, violent extremism, 
no. And what prompted us to reach this decision is a discussion that we had recently amongst ourselves as imams. And we talked about the fact that uh, 13 years ago, right after September 11th and the attacks of September 11th, that we uh, got together as imams and we wrote and published a brochure in which we offered condolences to innocent people who lost their lives that day. And we know that there were many Muslims that lost their lives that day. In fact, we prayed uh, Salatul Janaza Khai about three blocks from where the Twin Towers went down. This is 13 years ago. And also, in this brochure that we made, we made 10,000 copies of the brochure. And we went and we stood out on the streets of New York City, distributing by hand the brochure, offering condolences, denouncing acts of political violence that, that target innocent non-combatant people. And also we declared that there were injustices in the Muslim world that needed to be addressed and that we were in fact ourselves striving to address. But that our addressing of the injustices that are affecting Muslims and other people on the planet Earth, that our position is that we have to address those injustices within the boundaries, within the limits set by Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and set by the Messenger of Allah, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we did that 13 years ago. 13 years ago, after the September 11th attacks, when they occurred, you know, back then, it was not common for people to be able to associate Islam and Muslims with acts of global terrorism. Now, every day you turn on the television set and hear someone declaring themselves to be a Muslim declaring themselves to be of the people of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and declaring themselves to be doing things in the name of Islam or in the name of Allah or in defense of Islam while at the same time breaking the laws of Islam as set by Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So the Imams, we said, we decided that it was time for us to update our major statement with regards to justice and violent extremism. What is violent extremism? Violent extremism is when people target innocent, non-combatant people for attacks or for death which supersedes the sacred law of every tradition. And so we declared that it doesn't matter the, whether the perpetrator or the victim. It does not matter their religion, their ethnic group, whether they're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. Because the sacred law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the law that we find in the Quran, the law that we find in the Torah, the law that we find in the Injil, that law declares that the life of people, the innocent lives of people are sacred. That law declares, if you look in the Quran, it's there. If you look in the Torah, it's there. 
if you look in the Injil, they refer back to what's in the Torah. It's there that if you take the life of an innocent person, murder a single innocent person, the scriptures say, it's just like you murdering all of mankind. And if you save the life of a single innocent person, it's just like you saving all of mankind. So we need to today talk about this. And of course, those of you who come here on a regular basis, you know that you know what makes this day special is the fact that the imams are doing it throughout the city. But we do this all the time here, don't we? <laughs> All the time we address matters of justice and injustice. All the time we strive to separate that which Allah has made lawful from that which Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala has made unlawful. And so we have listened to a single verse from the speech of Allah wherein Allah gives us the narrative of him speaking to the angels prior to the creation of Adam, at least now. Angels and jinn both were in existence before we were, before Abu Basha, before the father of mankind, Adam, at least So Allah says that he spoke to the angels and he said to them, listen, I'm about to create a special type of being. He's not going to be angels like you. He's not going to be jinn like the other guy. This is a special being. And this being is going to be my Khalifa on earth. This is what Allah says in the Quran. Uh, oftentimes in the English translations of the Quran, we see Khalifa translated as a vicegerent. <coughs> You know, I, I, uh, a Khalifa is a ruler who rules in the name of a higher power. Just like you have a sheriff, you have a deputy sheriff. You have a marshal, you have deputy marshals. Well, Allah, Tabaraka wa ta'ala is Malikul Mulk. Allah is the sovereign of supreme authority over the entire universe. And he decided that he would put on the earth a being who would rule in his name. A species who would rule in his name. Allah created the earth. He said, I'm going to create human beings to safeguard and protect the earth. Protect the air. Protect the water. Not abuse it, but protect it. And... Allah says that when he told the angels he was about to do this, that the angels, uh, respectfully I would imagine, questioned him. Why would you do that? Why would you create, and, and, and look at how they describe us, why would you put in place someone who's going to make mischief and shed blood when you already have us here? And we don't make any mischief. We don't shed any blood. All we do is say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allah Akbar. All we do is sing your praises. And it's very interesting, you know, if you read Tafsir of this ayah, I recommend you read the, the scholarly commentator commentary on this verse. Because like Tafsir Ibn Kathir, Rahimullah. The scholarly commentator says that by the time all of this had happened, that there had already been a war on earth. And that the war had been instituted and fought by the jinn. So the angels were basing their question on what had happened before Allah created man. And they were saying, you already had one of your creation here shedding blood and making mission. Why would you create somebody else who's going to do that same thing? And Allah says in supreme wisdom, Inni alamu ma la ta'alamu. I know 
what you do not know. So this is a verse in which the human capacity for shedding blood violently, the human capacity for violent and wanton killing is cited, cited by the angels, and in which the human capacity to overcome that tendency is also cited. Allah says to the angels, yeah, yeah, I know. But I know better than you. I know things about this, this human being that I'm about to create that you don't know. Oh, you worship Allah. There is a story amongst the ancients that says that once there was a renowned teacher of religion. He was a sheikh. He was a, an, an, an elder, a knowledgeable, wise elder. And he was known far and wide for his ability to articulate and to transmit the teachings of sacred tradition. Uppermost being preservation of life. Do you know that if you get a book of Sharia, a book of Sharia, you look in it, that the first two priorities in books of Islamic sacred law, first two priorities are preservation of Deen al Islam, preservation of the Deen, preservation of of Tawheed and preservation of human life. Look at, get any book of Islamic law and look in there. The preservation of human life is a top priority for the people of La ilaha illallah. So anyway, there was this shaft and one day he was um, sitting on a a big rock by the side of the road. And a young man came riding by slowly on a horse. And, he, and the young man, he was young. He was arrogant like a lot of young people are. And he looked to the side of the road and he saw the shack sitting on the rock. And he called out to the shack and said, say, old man, I know who you are. I have a question for you. And the sheriff looked at the young man. He said, okay, well, what is it? The young man said, I understand that you are renowned for teaching the values of the sacred tradition. The sheriff said, well, I guess so. The young man said, and the sacred tradition is designed to uplift humanity through the preservation of the sacred values, right? The chef said, yes, that's true. And the young man said, and when we look throughout the earth, we see that the teachings of the sacred tradition have spread throughout the planet, right? Sheikh said, yes, young man. Yes. So why is it then, the young man said, if the teachings of the sacred tradition that are designed to uplift humanity are spread throughout the planet Earth, then why is it that when we look throughout the globe, we don't find humanity uplifted. We find humanity in a downtrodden position. Downtrodden, oppressed, degraded, debased. But the teachings are everywhere. Why is that? So the old man smiled a little smile. And he looked at the young man and he said, 
it is true that when we look through the planet Earth, we find humanity in a downtrodden condition. But were it not for the sacred traditions of the faith, he said, humanity would not be downtrodden. Humanity would be extinct, he said. Oh, you who worship Allah. So it is here and now. You have people who you always see them pointing the finger at people of religion or people of faith and blaming us for the condition of the downtrodden condition of humanity. As if it's believers and not unbelievers who, who visit scientifically designed poverty on the people of the earth. As if it isn't unbelievers people who violate the laws of every sacred tradition, who are not running these huge corporations that are raping the earth and polluting the oceans, as if it's people who pray and, 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 and fast and strive to get into paradise as if they're the ones over the governments that are murdering innocent people day in and day out. They have, as the younger generation says, they've got it twisted. They have it twisted. It's not those who submit to Allah who are responsible for the fitna and the injustice. It's those rebelling against Allah. It's not those who follow the sacred traditions. It's those who are disobedient to Allah in regards of what they call themselves. Listen, listen to me now. There's some of those people call themselves Muslim. Some of those people call themselves Christian. Some of them people, some of those people, they call themselves Jews or Buddhists or Hindus. It doesn't matter what they call themselves or their appearance. What matters is uh, uh, the Prophet Salam said, Allah does not look to your outer appearances and your forms, but rather Allah looks to your hearts and your deeds. So people should not be uh, deceived by the fact of this oppression uh, being visited upon humanity by people claiming a religion. When I was a child in the South, I used to hear grown folks say, uh, and they were saying it within the context of church culture, but it, it, it applied, I used to hear grown folks say, oh him or her, uh, they're just using the good name of God to shield their own dirty religion. That's what I used to hear when I was a child. They're using the good, they using the good name of God, but their real religion, the religion that worships uh, uh, the life of this world and that worships the earth and that worships wealth and that worships political power and that worships ego and all that's their real deal and by the way we should also remember that hey it's not just people claiming religion you have a lot of people who just flat out are atheists they tell you man I don't believe in God or they'll tell you I'm God uh, you know you got, or they'll tell you, I worship uh, Satan. I worship Satan. Don't forget where we are. <laughs> and, and you know what? You, the, the, if there, if there's only one, I believe there's more than one. But if there's only one country that defends the right of people to defy the sacred laws, it's the country in which we are living. If there's one country in which uh, uh, blasphemy is constitutionally protected, is this country. So we have to be aware, we have to be aware that religion, sincere religion, sincere religion designed to protect human life and to moderate 
to moderate the tendency of all human beings, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of where they are on the planet, there exists within the nature of human beings a capacity to, as we say, go off, a capacity to exceed the boundaries, a capacity to become uh, extreme instead of being moderate. And so, as you have heard me say before, in the Quran, in Surah Tarum, Surah number 30, which is the Surah of the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala makes the statement, Zahara al-Fasad fil barri wa bahri, bima kasabat aydin nas, lidhikahum ba'd al-lazhi amilu, la'allahum yarji'un, Allah says. Fasad, mischief, corruption, evil, Allah says has appeared on land and sea because of what the hands of men have earned in order that Allah may give them a taste of some of their deeds that perhaps la'allahum perhaps they may turn back from evil O you who worship Allah and furthermore we find in a hadith Qudsi that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah has said, Allah has said, I have forbidden Zulm, evil, oppression, <coughs> repression. I have forbidden Zulm for myself, Allah says. Therefore, do not commit Zulm against one another. This, this is Allah talking not only to the believers, but to every human being. He said, I don't oppress. No one has power like me. You, you have atomic bombs. I have uh, entire star systems. You, you, you drop a bomb on somebody, I can drop a mountain on them. You do whatever it is that you do is nothing. I'll send a rainstorm and 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 uh, cripple whatever it is that you can do. You, you remember years ago, way back in the eighties. Some of you remember. Some of you too young to remember. But you remember way back in the eighties what they called the Iranian hostage crisis when these students they took over the Iranian. Uh, the embassy, American embassy in Iran, and they had these hostages, and they were holding them. And the, the president at that time was President Jimmy Carter, as the commander in chief. He said, "Well, he told the military, go get our people." And the American military, the most powerful military in the world, with the most highly sophisticated weapons at that time, and their their special helicopters and. Navy SEALs and all, they mobilized, got all their best stuff and got a secret plan to go in to rescue these hostages. And then they went in in the dead of night and the whole operation got scrapped because of a sandstorm. <laughs> Nothing but wind and sand overcame all that technology. So Allah says, I'm the one who is al Qawi, I'm the one who is al Jabbar, and, and, and I don't oppress anybody. I'm not unjust to the smallest thing in creation, therefore, don't you be unjust. But when we look through the planet Earth, <clears throat> we see Zahar al Fasad. We see rising over the creation injustice, exploitation. And, and, and it's an evil that affects not only people, it affects everything on the planet. They're being unjust to birds and 
Uh, you know, when you turn on the television and you see the BP oil spill or something like that, and innocent creatures, birds, and sea life, you see them laid up all crippled with oil all over their bodies because of the abuse that has been heaped upon nature by people seeking nothing more than a profit. Profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. Nothing with people whose only purpose in life is to make more money. They got so much money, they don't even know what to do with it. Right? And as, as the people of faith always say in America, you can't take it with you. So this is the world that we live in. We live in a world in which human beings are suffering. Every other week, there's some kind of new crisis, global crisis. And the crisis always affects most people who are poor, people who are powerless. <laughs> Several weeks ago, you know, uh, 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 innocent girls were being kidnapped by fanatics in Africa. Now it's Ebola. Uh, now, now, a couple of weeks from now, it'll be something else. Uh, that type of stuff doesn't happen amongst the rich and the affluent. And may I say it, that kind of stuff definitely doesn't happen amongst, amongst rich, affluent white people. <laughs> Every time something like that happens, the people who are suffering are always people of color. Uh, you know, people who are black, people who are brown, people who are whatever, whatever, whatever. And they're always poor people. I was watching television the other day. And here's a commercial that comes on TV. I, and I've seen it several times. That's targeting white people who are now becoming heroin addicts. Mm. Now, have, 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 have you seen these commercials? Every time the commercial comes on and there's some poor mother talking about her son who's been addicted, he was a nice boy, and this, that, and the other. And so far, so far, every one of those commercials I've seen, the people have been white. And then they say, if you have this problem, call so-and-so phone number to get help. As of about two years ago, the NYPD started carrying special uh, needles so that if they run up on someone who has overdosed from heroin, they all they gotta do is reach in their little bag, you know, like the bag Batman carries, you know, the utility belt, they reach in there, pull it out, boom, hit them, they can save the person's life. Now that heroin is back. And now that the people using heroin are white people. But back when the users of heroin were black people, you know, back when heroin was king heroin, you understand, you never saw a commercial on TV. What do we get? A war on drugs. You never saw a commercial, if you need help, call this number. You never saw any women of color whose sons and daughters were, have fallen victim to addiction on there saying, well, my boy was a good boy. My daughter was, she was good. Now, you understand, so what, what is this? This is the unequal application of justice. This is not uh, democracy. This is what Al-Hajj Malik Al-Shabazz Malcolm X, Rahmatullah he, 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 he didn't have anything against democracy. He said, I'm not against democracy, I'm against the hypocrisy of democracy. <laughs> so why do you say these things, Imam Talib? Because as Muslims, we're supposed to ask ourselves, Wow, with all of these problems in the world, what do I do? What, what should we do? Particularly when the victims of the injustice are Muslims. And for a moment, we're going to set aside the fact that a lot of the victims of violent extremism are Muslims themselves. 
and the violence is being directed against them by other Muslims. Okay? Most of the parts of the earth where Muslims are being <coughs> oppressed, it's a Muslim hand hovering over their head, uh, you know what I mean? Taking innocent lives. But we're, we're going to set that aside for, for a moment. What should we do in the face of evil? What should the Muslim do in the face of evil? Prophet Muhammad told us what to do. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, when you see an evil, change it with your hand. He don't say you have to just sit there and take it, man. Change it, he said, with your hand. And if you can't do that, he said, then speak out against it. Speak out against what's wrong. Speak out against the injustices. Speak out against the evil. And if you can't do that, he said, then at least hate it in your heart, resist it in your heart. Man, you got me. Your, you have, your military might surpasses mine. Your economic system has me in its grips, but I'm not giving in, man. I'm going to keep practicing sabran, and I'm going to keep making dua against you and your oppressive self until Allah deals with you, since I can't deal with you myself uh, right now. The Prophet Islam said, beware of the dua of the oppressed. <laughs> hmm? See, you could throw bombs at somebody and curse them out and all that, but when believers start praying against somebody, oh, that's how you're going to treat us, okay? Here's how we do this. I'm going to do something that you can't do. I'm going to raise my hands to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm going to ask him to humiliate you, not to curse you. Once uh, the, uh, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was on the, uh, uh, the edge of a battlefield. And... Uh, one of the believers saw Sahih Hadith, the believers, uh, one of the believers yelled out to the prophet, Ya Rasulullah, curse them. You know, bring, bring down a curse on them. The prophet of Islam looked at the believer and he said, Allah did not send me here to curse anybody. I'm, you know, in other words, he said, man, I'm not some kind of witch. Or, uh, uh, so I'm a messenger of Allah. Allah didn't send me to curse. So when you uh, study the history of Islam, get yourself a good sira of Islam, you find, for instance, that when the Muslims were going into battle, they always kept the Prophet and they Salaam back, you know, uh, uh, away from the danger zone. And when they were about to commence the battle, Rasulullah and they Salaam was Salat, he would step out and he would raise his hands and he would Pray to Allah to barakah with the Allah for the believers. Or oh, Allah gives them victory over their enemies. Or oh, Allah humiliate their enemies. And one time, you know, things got a little uh, got a little rough, a little perilous. So he said, "Well, after I after I make this dua, uh, 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 I better put a little insurance on it." So he bent down and picked up a handful of dust and threw it at the enemy. And confused. See, if you, if you know your history of Islam, you know these type of things. And Allah said, you know, uh, excuse me, I'm just going to paraphrase a little. And Allah looked down and the Muslims were getting their butt kicked. Allah said, well, they ain't got enough troops, so let me send some angels to fight on their side. 3,000 or 5,000, 7,000, 8. See, these are the things that believers hold dear. Oh, you who worship so I wanted to just reinforce this message today. Justice, yes. Religious extremism, no. You can't go beyond the boundary of what Allah has said and expect Allah to bless what you're doing. You can't get, not if you're a believer. See, this is the difference between believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers, the unbeliever, he only believes in what he can see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or feel. He only believes in the, in the material. He only believes in physical power. He doesn't believe in spiritual power. 
but the believer, the believer believes in the uh, uh, gamey wash I had, the seen and the unseen. That's what we believe in. So Allah tells us, well, okay, you got it, you're, you're under some impression, by all means, deal with your oppression. But do it the way I say do it. Don't do it the way you want to do it. Do it the way I say do it. Someone asked me the other day, well, what's wrong with the Muslim? I'm just going to, he said, what's wrong with the Muslims? Every time I look, y'all cutting off people's heads, and you're doing this, you, you, you're slaughtering innocent people. What's wrong with you? So I, I was asked that. So I said, well, the first thing that's wrong with us is we're following behind Christians and Jews, I said. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ predicted that there will come a time when the Muslims would follow right behind the Christians and Jews to the extent that if they slithered down a lizard hole, the Muslims would slither down the lizard hole behind them. And when you look at the history of Christianity, and you look at the history of Judaism, you find constant murder, wanton bloodshed. I mean, you know, I had to tell somebody the other day, have you forgot that in 1492, now last Monday was Columbus Day, correct? Now, last Monday was Columbus Day, and I'm sitting there watching all of these people <laughs> celebrate, in essence, the takeover of another country, the slaughter of innocent people, and they, 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 they forget about all that. Columbus discovered America. Oh, you're a liar. So I'm looking at this, mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. celebrating genocide. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't see any Native Americans walking into Columbus Day Parade. Just like Thanksgiving is coming, you're not going to see any Native Americans standing up, you know, on Thanksgiving. It's a day of mourning for them. Mm. A day of mourning for them. So I said, so the first thing wrong with, that's wrong with us is we're following the standard of other people instead of following the standard that has been given to us. And then the second thing I said to them, and if you want to understand all of these horrible things that Muslims are doing. Not all Muslims, they ain't but a hand, you know? Of, but if you want to understand these uh, acts of violent extremism being committed by a small minority of the Muslims, I told them, don't blame the Quran. I told them what you really need to do is you need to get a copy of a book that was written almost 50 years ago that's called The Wretched of the Earth. The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, who was a psychologist. And in that book that he wrote almost 50 years ago, he talked about the violence of oppression and how the violence of oppression could drive people crazy so that the only priority in the mind of the oppressed becomes shedding the blood of the oppressor. They don't care how they do it, they don't care to what extent, and everything, their religious values, everything goes out the window and they become obsessed with shedding blood in defense of freedom as their oppressors are obsessed with shedding blood in defense of tyranny. So when you see people who are claiming to be people of God, and they're just acting insane, man. Uh, you know, taking the, the blood of innocent people. I, I got to watch the clock, man. Don't get me started. I told, I said right here just a few weeks ago that in the history of America, <clears throat> there were two innocent people who were victimized in order to create the United States of America. One was the Native Americans, and, and, and the people of superior military power, they just, as we say in the street, they just butched it all, man. Took the land from the, from the innocent men, women, and children who were here. Took their land, put them on uh, concentra in, in, in concentration camps that they call reservations, 
slaughtered them, and, and just took it over. So nowadays they say, well, oh yeah, you descended from those people? Yeah, we know, we know. Here's a scholarship for you to go to college. You don't have to pay anything because we know what we did to you. The other people were the innocent men, innocent, non-combatant men, women, and children of Africa who were taken from their land and brought here by force. They aren't immigrants. I'm talking to a Muslim brother the other day, and he said to me, well, you know, we're all immigrants. I told him, man, you're an immigrant. I'm not, man. The only kind of immigrant that I am is what they call forced migration, which nowadays is an international crime. It's a crime in international law to uproot a people and to force them somewhere. Hmm? So I said from this member just a few weeks ago that uh, there was a man who had been, he, he was an African American, his name was Denmark Vesey, and he was able to uh, get some money and buy himself out of slavery. He was a slave. And then he went around using his free status from one plantation to the other organizing an uprising. And they were able to keep their plan a secret until the night before the uprising. And it was planned to be something that has never been seen in American history. It was going to make the rebellion of Nat Turner, for those of, those of you who you know I mean, if you don't know that name, Nat, Nat Turner, you need to go home and do a Google search. Mm -hmm. I mean, those of you who come from other countries, you need to know the history of the country that you're living in now and which your children are being born. It was going to make the, the, the rebellion of Nat Turner look like a walk in the park on a sunny day in Coney Island. And as Denmark Vesey went around meeting with groups of African slaves, on pl and they, they were planning bloodshed. <clears throat> so according to historians, one historian's name is David Robinson, according to historians, he went on this one plantation <coughs> and met in secret, and they, he was telling them, listen, a couple more days, we're getting ready to kill everything that moves. Hmm. And he's talking to them and the Muslims who were in the group. Okay, because these are uh, of Africa, some of them are Muslims, some of them are whatever, whatever, whatever. The Muslims in the group said, wait a minute. We're being oppressed and we want to be free. <clears throat> and we will wage jihad against these people who've kidnapped us and murdered us and all of that other stuff. They said, but we are Muslims. We don't kill innocent people. We are Muslims. We don't take the lives of women and children and old people. Because if we start doing that type of stuff, Allah is going to punish us and chastise us, and we'll never be free. This, this is what they told Denmark Vesey, who was a Christian, by the way. So he's Denmark Vesey said, well, okay, and there's some other Africans who were not Muslim. They said, well, you know how the Muslims are, man. They don't kill innocent people, but we do. So just you give that responsibility to us, and we'll take care of it. Now, now, look, look at that. See, look at that example. Man. What's wrong with Muslims nowadays that we don't understand the sacred value of life and understand that freedom, justice, and equality are sacred values, but you can't engage in murder and killing innocent people, etc. And, and, and that which is haram in pursuit of the halal. You can't take an unlawful path to a lawful end. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with us. Amen. May Allah protect us and may Allah protect the innocent. Amen. Freedom, yes. Justice, yes. Violent extremism, no. And may Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala guide the Ummah. Subhanaka wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. Oh, yeah. 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعد فقال الله تعالى في سورة آل إمران بسم الله كنت خير أمة أخرجة للناس تعملون بالمعروف وتنحون عن المنقر وتؤمنون بالله ولو آمن أقل الكتاب لكان خيرا لهم منهم المؤمنون وأكثرهم الفاسقون وسلط الله الله وفقنا مسلمين ومسلمات ومؤمنين ومؤمنات ومحسنين ومحسنات وبعد. Dear believers, I want to thank you for your uh, uh, patience with the uh, time. So I'm going to wrap the kutbah. I'm going to wrap it up just by citing one ayah uh, from the Quran and uh, and one hadith. This ayah from the Quran, when Allah says. You are the best of people evolved for mankind, enjoying what is right, forbidding what is wrong, and believing in Allah. <coughs> if only the people of the book had faith, it would be best for them. Among them are some who have faith, but most of them are perverted transgressors, Allah says. Oh, you who worship Allah, Allah has called us up as a faith community to, for us to be the best of people. If we obey the Quran and we obey and follow the example of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that means that everything that human beings are engaged in, we're supposed to be put forth the best example, and that includes struggling against oppression. People are supposed to look at the Muslim. People are supposed to be able to look at any Muslim, the way we eat, the way we treat our women the way we treat our elders and our children, even the way we fight when you gotta fight, the way that we engage in diplomacy. People are supposed to be able to look at Muslims and say, wow, man, I, tell me more about that way of life. I've, I've, ne I've never seen anybody act like you all act. Like I gave you the example of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, the, the, who, who was called amongst the Sahaba, he was called Asadullah, the Lion of Allah. And one day the Muslims were, were in a fight, man, a battle, a war with unbelievers. And Ali, who was a tremendous warrior, he draws his sword and he's fighting in the midst and he knocks one of the calf, you know, he knocks one of the unbelievers down and he draws his sword, he's getting ready to take his head. You've heard me tell this history. And the unbeliever's laying on his back and he looks up and he sees Ali getting ready to take his head and he's helping, he can't do anything else, so he spits in Ali's face. You know, like a final act of Arab defiance. Ah, who up spits in his face? And Ali looks at the guy and looks at him and turns around and walks away, sheaves his soul. And the guy who was about to be killed, not wantonly, but in the heat of battle, you know, let's let's take an update that. We gotta update. So they're fighting, Ali knocks him down and draws his automatic weapon, click, clack, 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 and points it at him. And the guy spits it in his face. <sighs> Ali puts the safety back on and walks away. The guy was so astonished, he called after him. Oh, Lion of Allah, I thought you was getting ready to murder me, man. What's up? Ali turned around and said, I was getting ready to take your life. But I was going to take your life for Allah, not for me. But when you spit in my face, you made it personal, man. 
And if I had taken your life then, it would have been for me, not for Allah. So you know what? You got to pass, man. I'm out of here. Those are the ethics of this religion of Islam. And people heard that. They said, wow, man. Even the way that we fight is supposed to say, well, I don't agree with them. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Muslim. But I respect the way that they conduct themselves. Nobody respecting anything and thinking about becoming a, a Muslim after watching some of these crazy acts of violent extremism that some of these Muslims are doing. Nobody want to follow them except some other demented person like them. The Muslims should be conducted because we believe in Allah. And because we believe in the ultimate victory, the Muslims are supposed to be rolling in such a way that even people who are non-Muslims say, well, I ain't a Muslim, but man, I understand what they're doing. And I support their struggle. Uh, the, I, in fact, pass me that Quran. I want to see what, you know what I mean? So that's one thing. We're the best of people, uh, and we have to be careful that shaitan does not corrupt the heart of the Muslim and take what could be, hey, listen, there are legitimate injustices in the world. There are innocent Muslims being killed by people who are Muslim, people who are Christian, people who are unbelieving, people who are atheists. And if, and if they're being killed, then they should defend themselves. There's a difference between self-defense and murder. But it must be done in a way that will please Allah. And lastly, I'm just going to read the hadith and I'm finished. L listen to this hadith carefully now. And think, think about what's going on. Think about what you see when you turn on the news or you go to YouTube and you see, you know, people standing there, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and they got somebody, they got the weapon, the other person doesn't have one and think about that and listen to this hadith and this hadith is reported is from Kitab uh, uh, al-Fitan you always hear me tell you to go read that go get your Sahih hadith and turn to the book of Fitna and look in there you'll see this hadith narrated by Ali ibn Abi Talib Ali ibn Abi Talib said when you see the black flags, remain where you are and do not move your hands or your feet. Thereafter there shall appear a weak, insignificant people. Their hearts will be like fragments of iron. They will have the state. They will fulfill neither covenant nor agreement. They will call to the truth, but they will not be people of the truth. Their names will be parental attributions, and their aliases will be derived from towns. Their hair will be free-flowing like that of women. This situation will remain until they differ and split up among themselves. Thereafter, Allah will bring forth the truth through whomever he will. Oh, you who worship Allah. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he said, when you see the black flags, we got extremist Muslims running around right now with black flags. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, remain where you are. What do you mean by that? He said, when you see these people, stand where you are. Uh, like we said, stand fast. Don't run to join them. <laughs> Don't run to get in the ranks with them. Ali said, do not move your hands or your feet. Don't help them either. Ali said, thereafter there shall appear a weak, insignificant people, meaning weak in terms of religion, weak in terms of morality, uh, weak in terms of religious uh, practice. And he said, their hearts will be like fragments of iron. 
even in man, they have no human capacity. Uh, what do you call that? Compassion. Their hearts are like iron. They murder, they murder prisoners of war. That's not the sunnah of Rasulullah. The Prophet of Islam didn't murder prisoners of war. But Ali said these people, they will, uh, meaning they will kill prisoners of war and cruelly torture people. And he said they will have this state, meaning they're going to be organized. They're going to declare a caliphate or whatever, whatever it is that they do. And he said they will fulfill neither covenant nor agreement, meaning they're not going to conduct themselves according to the Sharia. They're not going to conduct themselves according to international law. They're going to do what they want to do and how they want to do it. And now they said they will call to the truth. Well, you know the truth is Deen al Islam. But they will not be people of the truth. They will not be following the Quran and the Sunnah. Their names will be parental, uh, uh, man, this is deep. Their name will be parental attribution. Abu so and so. Uh, what's your name? What's your name, boy? My name is Abu so and so. He might not even be married and have any children. Uh, my, I'm Abu. Yeah, Abu. And the aliases will be derived from towns. You know, they say, what is your name? My name is Abu so-and-so al-Tunisi. My name is Abu so-and-so al-Amriki. My name is Abu so-and-so al-Baghdadi. Uh, you know, you know man, what is your name, man? They're taking their names from town and and free-flowing hair like women. Uh, next time this stuff come on the TV, take a look. Uh, sometimes you see long hair coming out from underneath that uh, that turban, man. You want to tell them, why don't you cut your hair, man? <laughs> Until they differ among themselves, meaning eventually. Eventually, these groups going to split up, you know, and be fighting amongst themselves just like every other group like the ones that are here now has done that in the past, and therefore, or thereafter, as he said, Allah will bring forth the truth through whomever he wills, meaning through clear and open manifestation of the truth. Oh, you who worship Allah. That's, that's the message for today. That's the message for today. Once someone came, you know, we need to remember Prophet Muhammad and Islam was a prophet. Caught the Munnebi'i. So the prophet said things 1,400 years ago that apply right now because he's speaking from a heart enlightened through prophecy. So someone went to the prophet and they said, I'm going to say, through the law. What are we going to do if in the future, after you're gone, the, the, the Muslims are fighting one another and people on both sides of the argument are yelling, la 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 la, Muhammad Rasulullah, and they shedding blood, what should we do? The Prophet said, step back from them and grab a hold of the Quran and the Sunnah, he said, like a person grabbing a tree uh, with their hands and their teeth. Mm. You know, like how when, when uh, what do you call those things, tornadoes, tornado come, and if you don't want to be swept away, and to your destruction, you find something solid to grab a hold of, and you have to hold to the wind, Pastor. I say to you, hold to the Quran and the Sunday. Remember that Allah has made us a moderate people, a balanced people. And when you see anybody calling us as Muslims to extremism, don't, don't root for them. Yeah, yeah, man, they hit the kufar and get near. Yeah, man, the white man is getting his. Yeah, man, see, yeah, I don't like this country anyway, man, because I went and I applied for welfare, even though I can work, and they told me I couldn't get no welfare, so down with America. <laughs> Come on, man. No. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Oppression and violent extremism are wrong, and two wrongs do not make a right. If somebody else is wrong and they're oppressing us, we can't be wrong in defense of ourselves. 
right is right, wrong is wrong, and two wrongs don't make a right. Only right <coughs> makes right. And as Muslims, Allah and his messenger are the ones who tell us what's right and what's wrong. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, astaghfiru ka wa atubu ilik, ameen wa aqa ikamah.